Welcome everyone. I am Matilde Siman. I am the mental health specialist at Glasswing International. Thank you for attending our panel, Play in Mental Health. We hope to provide you all with a dynamic roundtable discussion, um, conversation, exploring how play supports mental health and overall well-being for children and adults alike. A quick note to our audience, you will be prompted to fill out two polls. One will be launched now at the beginning of our session, and the second poll will be as we close out. These are optional, but we encourage you to participate. You can submit your answers on the right side of the screen. For those of you just joining in, I wanted to share some background on our organization. Glasswing International, its mission is to address the root causes and consequences of violence and poverty through mental health and education programs that empower youth and communities and strengthen public systems. Through our cross-sector alliances and evidence-based programming, Glasswing creates opportunities for local change makers to thrive. And on that note, I am excited to introduce you all to our amazing panelists here today. Joining us is Priscila Ramalho, Manager of Research and Education at Sesame Workshop in Brazil, Eva Fernandes, Manager of Social Investments in Early Childhood at the FEMSA Foundation, and Andrea Hernandez, Program Manager at the Lego Foundation in Mexico City. Moving into our conversation. So we started off by asking this panel, by asking the audience, is it ever too early to address mental health in children? And while we'll see those awful results come in slowly, I want to turn it first to our panel to answer. Is it ever too early to address mental health? And more importantly, or more relevant to the conversation, is it ever too early to play? Um, um, I could start if, if that's okay with the rest of the colleagues. It's amazing to... I was going to say see, but we can't really see you all. But we imagine a room full of people. Uh, thank you very much for being here. And I, I think both of those answers should be no. Uh, it's never too early to address mental health. Mental health can start since the child is born. And in the LEGO Foundation, we never say that it's too early to play on the total opposite. When, when a child is born, and especially the first three years, those connections that the caregiver can have with the child through play are the most important that a child can have in their lives. So no, it's never too early. Yeah. Um, yeah, strongly no for both questions. And I think first, because uh, it's never too early uh, to address mental health, because you know, in early childhood, that's when the children are developing habits that they will carry throughout their lives. So um, at Sesame, what we do when we uh, to recognize their emotions, to deal with their emotions, we, we are hoping that they will practice and they will use these techniques throughout their lives. So that's the best time to actually start um, addressing mental health. And it's never, of course, it's never early to to play because that's through play that kids learn every, anything. That's the way, that's what kids should be doing and must be doing. Um, hi everyone, I'm very excited to be here uh, with with uh, with you all. And and I, I agree with my, my colleagues. I think it's never too early to play. It's also never too early to play or to address mental health. It, it, I meant too early or too late, right? And um, I think, one of the things that is, I think is really important is that we connect um, mental health with our physical health and our emotional health, uh, because we tend to see them uh, in, in, uh, in silos, where what we know from child development and really from development of humans in general is that they're all interconnected. So addressing mental health is important from, the, from infancy, uh, particularly because as, 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 Priscilla, was, as Priscilla was saying, uh, me mental, uh, our, our brains, brain development is so important and so on, such a, an, uh, a relevant part of what happens in the first, in the beginning of life. So it's, it's, the, it's the brain that's developing, but it's also our, our systems, right? Our immune system, our, our other, other body health systems are developing at the same time. And I think it's important that we see them together 
and and that we see play as one of the best uh, and easiest ways humans learn and and so from the beginning uh, from infancy uh, babies start playing and and they cue us to play with them so i i think that's um you know i think uh i would just maybe add something because uh whatever was saying is uh made me think that we're talking about mental health as as a as a it's an end in itself and it is because of course it's important uh for us that's a very important uh part of our life of our healthy life but in the in, in early childhood uh, the period of life that we are talking about it's also important to see mental health as a means for all learning that these children um are and it's a lot right it's physically it's uh, mental it's social uh, it's cognitive um so being mentally healthy allows the ch the children to have all these uh meaningful experiences and relations with uh with other people and with the world yeah and if i could add just one more thing uh and it's related to to what eva and priscilla just said it's not only just important for the child itself when it's growing up but it can also be a way to support mental health between the caregiver and the child when they're growing up right so those playful interactions that the children or the child and the baby can have with its caregiver, mother, father, whoever is around that child can support the mental health of the child, but also support the mental health of, of the adult that is around them. So those interactions, that love, that uh, we call it playful parenting, responsive caregiver, however you say it in your countries, but that, uh, that warmth and love that you can express to your child that can also support the mental health of, of both of the of the child and the, and the caregiver. Those are all super great responses. And what I'm hearing um, in common from all of your responses is that play oftentimes has, is a, it can be a bit stigmatized, right? We think play as being trivialized or not being important to neurocognitive development. Um, but what I'm hearing from, from the three of you is that play is a key and a crucial role in development and in parent or caregiver and child uh, bonding and interaction, right? It's a means to that end. It's a channel for this development and this essential stimuli that children and adults need, um, which really leads me, segues well into my next point, um, which is that, you know, decades have re of research have shown us that play is an important part of a child's development. And as experts in the field, the three of you, I'm sure, have so much uh, evidence to prove that. It assists with cognition, social skills, and as we're speaking now, mental health. Um, yet children today have less free time than previous generations and compounded with access to so much technology, sometimes that can be seen as a distraction to play. Some even argue that emphasizing non-academic development could limit a, ch a child's attention span and get in the way of academic performance. Like we, I, I just said recently, right, that play can be stigmatized as a distraction. What would the three of you say to that argument? Maybe, um, I don't know, maybe I'll start because um, showing a picture that I, let me see if I can, if I can do that. Let's see. Um, I uploaded here, I hope. So these, you can see it. You can, can see it? Yes. So this happened like four or five days ago when we were discussing uh, amongst the panelists um, today's discussion and this is my son and they were just they had just created this play with just a, ro a hole a rope of tire and that's something that i'm pretty sure uh most of you either you have already done it or um or you you know what it is about and maybe those who have done it can feel like i can i can feel you know the wind when i would do that uh maybe the fear that i would have like before doing that or before trying to do it in a different position um the reason why i chose this picture i was looking at him and i thought wow we're talking about play and the importance of play and uh when we say at sesame we take play as a very serious thing and when i say play is a serious thing sometimes people think it's just you know rhetoric rhetoric and when you see this picture there's so much going on there 
that I say, okay, this is why it's so serious. You know, uh, you can see like a lot of, uh, we talk so much about mindfulness flow. There is all about this when you, when you see the image. We talk about relationships. Uh, here you cannot see, but there was a friend and they were negotiating and how, how fast, how strong one should, could push the other and taking turns. Um, there is a lot about concentration, about testing the abilities. So what we're talking before, uh, so mental health, mental well-being as something that allows the child to explore, in this case, the abilities, the senses. Uh, so seeing the world through different uh, perspectives, I don't know, seeing the leaves on that tree differently, seeing the sky. This is all very serious. So I was like, yeah, we can, why serious needs to be boring we don't need or we need or need to be something directed so i just wanted to start uh this as a spark and i'll leave to my colleagues and i need to learn how okay maybe this off or leave it it's an amazing picture priscilla just leave it or, there. No, we, I, don't, <laughs> I, I left it for like a few minutes. i think i, I can priscilla uh, for sharing thank you so much for sharing that picture of your son and and what i'm hearing that we can add to the conversation is that play is not a distraction, right? That is the key takeaway. Play is not a distraction. It's a channel for key developmental milestones, um, especially in cognition, motor skills, fine motor skills, social skills. I mean, it's kind of like a one hit wonder, right? With, with what we could, what play could achieve. I'll let the rest of my panelists speak now. I was just going to add to, to what Priscilla just said. And in the Lego Foundation, we say that play is learning. So play is not actually just a fun thing that children can do. Of course, it's a fun thing that children do, but there's so much learning involved in playing. And when we say that non-academic things, and of course there's like, especially in the countries where we are, I think almost all from, um, they're very traditional academic focus. So play is not as important. So what we have to do is actually shift the mentality of all of these people and say like, actually when a child is playing, they're actually learning, no? And I, I wanted to take advantage of the picture that Priscilla just put because imagine all of the negotiations that Priscilla's son had to do or all the learnings and iterations that the child had to do in order to get the rope up or like get the special weight on so that he wouldn't fall. Like all of that is learning, right? And all of that is, creating all of these connections in the children's brain where they're growing up. So in the Lego Foundation, we never, like we actually say that they're learning through play because play is the basis of what that the child is gonna need. And play can lead you to all sorts of other learnings in life, like executive functions where they're gonna, afterwards they're gonna use them in their like adult life. So we never say that uh, play is not uh, a learning component, but actually you're learning through play your entire childhood. I, I, love, I love Andrea and Priscilla's answers. And I, I, I wanted to add something because I think um, one of the things Andrea was saying was about this mindset or cultural shift that I think we've undergone, we are undergoing, but it's still embedded in us. Um, the idea of discipline and play being different from learning and and discipline with being uh with receiving uh, you know a, a scolding or or, or or a big discussion on what you did wrong instead of thinking that 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 you can set limits or that you can correct or that you can discipline also through play uh, but but we don't feel comfortable doing it because we weren't brought up that way. We were brought up so so we we always go back to to to, to what we learned and what we heard from our grandparents, and this have to do with with you know the the with violence in many ways. And and we used to think that that was something that was hard to do, but had to be done as a way of correcting and and. And so we feel very uncomfortable as parents sometimes when we feel like we feel like we're not doing a good job if we don't play. Or there's always a mother or a mother-in-law or a father that would say you're not you're not being tough enough on this child with this child, right? You end up doing it wrong because you're not being clear enough with the limits. And I think that's the mindset and the cultural shift that we need to do. And but but we need to understand that that. It, it's uncomfortable for us to do as well because sometimes as adults 
we feel like we need to be in control and playing is about losing control and and about sharing control and and so it, i think it's really important that that we we understand this and and that we learn how we feel when we play because sometimes we feel frustrated or we get the phone the phone beeps or and, and we feel like we have to go back and and control and go back to dinner but kids I think it's we forget that we are modeling behavior all the time and kids will look at what we do and not always what we say and and so we can we can always say something but if we're not if we can't model it uh, we're we're not sharing this enough so I and and so I, I think we need to remember that play is a good way of of connecting with people and and connecting with our children and and of strengthening an emotional bond. So I, I, I think that's the only other thing that I, I think is really important that, that we think. And again, that we, we, we break with thinking that academics and play are separate because it's the same thing as thinking brain development and, and healthy body, other, you know, it's the same, we're the same body and, and playing and learning comes together. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Eva. I've, you said something that I want to highlight, that we model, right? That adults model through play as well. And that is something important to keep in mind, I'm sure, as caregiver for the audience who are caregivers and parents in the room. Um, oftentimes, like I, I was picturing a scenario in my head when you were when you were saying that of kids running around, maybe the mom or the dad trying to or the caregiver trying to complete chores and around the house and then saying right now is not the time for play. Right. Like, how do you like balance that as a caregiver? What would you say or what would the three of you say to our caregivers? Like, how do you balance responsibilities and play in a way that's not um, so it's not seen as something that you only have selected time for, but rather something that could be part of your life. Right. It's not just, OK, you have free play time for 30 minutes. It's playing throughout the day is how we learn about our emotions. Like you just said, you get frustrated. Um, oftentimes in kids, they have to take turns. And that could lead to frustration, anger, jealousy, right? We learn about our emotions through play. It's such a, a rich channel of, of learning experiences. So what would you say to the caregivers and in the room or, or in the audience of, of how to balance that? And what takeaways would you say that you would want them to have about um, incorporating play throughout their day as an adult and if they have kids? I can just also say like, um, let's also give a reminder that children are the the leads in the play, right? Like they they are the experts in play. They know what to do. They're amazing at playing. And for example, if we were doing a learning to play workshop, like sometimes we do, we always ask the audience, like, just remind yourself, like, of a childhood play. Like, remember how happy you were, how you were enjoying the time. And when you as an adult remind yourself of what it was like to play when you were a kid, you kind of like remember how important that 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 was in your life, right? Like how happy and like I got goosebumps and I almost cry every time that I use this activity. But it's it's the reminder of what it was like for you as a child when you were growing up. So I would give that advice, like just remind yourself that children are the experts at play. And the second one is also give yourself some, some like time. Like it's okay if sometimes you have to say that right now we're gonna stop for a little bit because we're gonna go eat, but you, we can go back to, to play time. Like as I said, like I think some of us have also have to be parents and we have also have to discipline and we have also, they need to learn that there's time for a certain stuff. Um, so I think it's also fair enough to say that you have to give certain times for it, uh, but also just as a reminder that children are are the experts at playing and and they know how to lead it. Yeah, and I think just in addition to that, I think that sometimes we're too concerned as caregivers, as parents, um, in directing or, you know, in setting the boundaries. And I'm not saying it's not important. It's very important to set, like, the boundaries. But, like, what is really, what are the boundaries that are really important? But sometimes we are so focused on that and we forget that it's also important to, as, as Andrea was saying, that understand that, okay, if the children are the experts, so let us observe them and let's 
what can we learn? I, the other day when I was thinking about the theme of this conference, I was thinking about the word. I, I, I love like to think about the orange, like what the words come from. And the word play in English is very interesting because in Portuguese, it doesn't have the same, um, it's not so um, comprehensive as in, it is in English. And I was thinking, okay, in English, I can use play for playing a song and can use play for play, like what we were saying, uh, play for a play, a theater, a drama play. And it's all about, uh, as Eva was saying, like losing control. I think that's what you said I, uh, or... Uh, like letting yourself get immersed on something. Uh, yes. And that's what kids do. And I think that's such, such something that is so important in adult life, you know, to also think about out of the box, to draw out of the lines. Um, so I think maybe just rethink our position as caregivers, as maybe observe uh, instead of, all right, like, okay, I need to tell them that's what to do. No, let's observe. Let's see what they're doing. They will express a lot in their play about their feelings, about how they see the world, what's going on. And maybe we can also learn a lot. You know, I'm sure we can learn a lot from, from this observation. Yes, I, I'll just add because I think those were very good. Um, I, I agree completely with everything I heard. Um, I, I think... Play is really in the end about, like like you were saying, Priscilla, it's about being in the present moment, which is really hard to do for adults. And I mean, I, I'm talking about myself, for me, it's very hard. We're always doing so many things at the same time that, that we forget that when we, we play, we're in the present moment. And 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 that's, I think, what, what I think kids teach us all the time about living in the moment and connecting with other people in, in really... Uh, in, in instant and, and, and kind of profound ways. And and I, I I also think, Andrea, you touched upon something that I, I want to say, to, to repeat, which is we also need to kind of cut ourselves some slack and, and be a little bit more more um, permissive or, or, or just allowing that, knowing that we, we're not perfect all the time, we lose our patience, we, we get frustrated, we cannot always be in play mode. Uh, but but the more we think about how we can be in the present moment with children when we are and how we can integrate play, which is, I think, Mati, what you were asking us, how can we integrate play into, into particularly with young kids, kids and babies? And I think that's something that we, uh, from from the work that I do, we, we look about, we look, we think about a lot about how we talk to parents about thinking that maybe when they when they're cooking kids can observe or when you're in the supermarket you can talk to children about colors and and that's something that that sesame workshop also is so good at doing right when you watch the content that sesame produces it's always about um you can integrate play when you're everywhere uh when you take a bath with or we're bathing a kid and you can show them or name the parts of the body or you can count uh, how many cars you pass on the street of what color i mean we've all done this and and i think it's easier uh, than than we all know how to do it but we have forgotten or or we forget that we that we know it and and, and so I, I think I, I, I have a story that I think about a lot, and, and this is something that that um, also in the work we do with with and the partnership with Lego Foundation, when we think about play, I've learned a lot from 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 their play, uh, the work they do about learning through play, uh, and and learn that sometimes uh, kids lead us into the play, right? And and one of my daughters has a game with me. We've never discussed the rules. We've never talked about it, but it's just something that exists. And, and sometimes after we get frustrated or something, she wants me to catch her and, and hug her. And she will just like give me a look or just run away from me when I'm looking for her. And I just know that it's a cue that I have to follow her around and that she will run around the house until I catch her. And when I do, we kind of hug and we snuggle. And it's something that we've never discussed the rules of this game. It's a game that she invented and I just follow whenever she 
excuse me into into the game. So I think we all have these things with our kids, but we just have to to recognize them and follow the lead, right? Thank you, Eva. These are amazing answers. And one of the things I, I keep hearing that, you know, we talk about adults and children in play, but the combination of both, right? We talk about how can we integrate play with adults and kids, caregivers and kids, right? And and there's a big cultural component to this too. It's not just caregivers, but um, I mean, I'm from a Latino household, so I know it's tias, abuelas, you know, you have everyone there playing and, and stimulating that developmental piece. Um, but I want to segue a little bit into play in adults, uh, aside from kids, right? We talk about play, and there's so much research out there about play in children. Um, and typically, at some point during adolescence and young adulthood, we start to stigmatize and trivialize play. It's irrelevant for adolescents. It's definitely not relevant as an adult, or at least that's what you know it, the perception is. Um, and we have so many more responsibilities as you grow up, grow older. Um, but does play in adulthood have similar benefits as it does in children and um, and adolescents? Um, and if so, how can we incentivize adults, whether it be in the workplace or or at home, outside of with kids, right? Just adults to play more to boost their mental health. What would you guys say? I can I can go. You want to, um, and I'm speaking as an adult that has no children, but is around children a lot. But also, like from first experience, I think like, of course, like when we grow older, we tend to like play is not the central part of it, right? Like adulthood, working, leaving, actually feeding yourself, like all of these things that we have to do in adulthood that don't necessarily involve play. But play can also be the the anxiety reducer. Play can also be how do you reduce stress and play in adulthood doesn't necessarily look exactly like I'm going to go kick a ball around. Right. But like play for me, Andrea is cooking. I love cooking. So for me, my, my playful, less stressful time is when I cook. Right. And that is for me is how I release my mental health or my partner is going around on a bicycle 60 kilometers per day. And that's the way that he plays every day. So I think, I think it's the definition that we give to play. And I think that's, that's uh, related to what Priscilla said. I think in adulthood, our hobbies can be how we identify, what we identify as play. And it definitely, I think, especially in COVID-19, where we were all in lockdown in our houses and we couldn't go anywhere. I think a lot of us actually had to deal with a lot of mental health um, crisis and a lot of things and anxiety and just just it was so uncertain for a lot of us um that we actually had to do a lot of things that we weren't used to and just those things that gave you a little bit of breathing time or helped you reduce your anxiety I would call that play like plays everything that just boosts your energy gives you just like leaves you with like, we have this word in Spanish, like apapacho, like just like, oh my God, this was wonderful. Like I'm very, very happy about uh, this activity. So I would say it has the same benefits. Yeah, I think as I was saying in the other question, I think if we take play as this more, from this more comprehensive um, meaning, we, we can see that for adults, being in this state of maybe a state of connectedness with what you're doing makes whatever work uh, you're doing much more meaningful for you and I think for the world. Uh, so we we become, we say that for kids, playing uh, and being mentally healthy, playing makes them more creative and engaged learners. So I think we can say the same for adults and that's really important. We need more creative solutions for for the world uh, issues. Uh, and I think through play, we um, that's the way that's the way we go around what is there and we understand I think when we get immersed, we really can find these solutions. And I think too uh, maybe then going back, you know to, I don't know, maybe theory of development. So in early childhood, what do how do kids what do kids do? They how do they learn through movement and through 
the exploration of the senses. So maybe as adults, we should also go back and value more movement as uh, the, the, the examples that Andrea was giving, they were all very related to movement. Sometimes we're, uh, you know, we're all the time sitting and then maybe that's, that's not the way, that's, that makes it more difficult to play. So maybe allow us ourselves to engage in movement, I don't know, circular dance and on other, other ways of engaging with the world through our bodies and also through our senses. So sometimes we do things so automatically that we're not using, we're missing a lot. There is a whole world there to be explored and we are not connecting well with this world, just maybe because we're not uh, having playful experiences in our daily lives. It's just the way, just, just like we say that for kids, um, and we insist that a lot, we want at Sesame, we, we, we want kids to have playful, positive, playful experiences, Maybe we can say the same for adults. I don't. I don't see why not. Yes, I I completely agree with with what Andrea and Priscilla are saying. I I wanted to to complement with saying that I think what what we forget sometimes is that in order for children to have a good uh, mental health and a good healthy beginning in life they need engaged adults uh, around them and and that it's really about the connections and the relationships that children have with the adults in their life that 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 develops kids healthily so when we go back to how do we promote mental health in children we really have to talk about how do we improve mental health in the adults that are raising these children and 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 as you say Mati, in 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 our households this includes a lot of people that are not just the parents and and it's a community that brings that that helps raises that help raise this child and many members in this community were raised in different contexts and in different time periods and 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 so I, I really think that we, we forget when we talk about play, uh, that play is something that we only do as children. And, and so that I think that's, if, if there's one thing we need to remember when, when we, and, and that's so great about this conference, is that when we discuss mental health, particularly for young children, we're really talking about how do we improve the mental health uh, and how do we get everyone to play? Because I think that's where, where we need to, to, to think, and I think I had already talked about this shift in 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 raising children, but or or in these mindsets. But but I think one that 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 doesn't serve us is is thinking that we always have to sacrifice and put children first. And by doing this, we feel that we are doing more for children. So the more I work, the more I can provide for my kid. Or I cannot play because I have to cook or I and 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 we forget that it's really if I'm not okay my children are not going to be okay and and the same goes for everyone we need to make sure that as parents we know that taking care of ourselves is also taking care of our child and us doing something that we enjoy and that like Andrea was saying means we are playing or enjoying it is a way for us to be a better parent, and and it's 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 the opposite of what we've been thinking for so long. So, uh, wanting our children to do well in, needs us to to make sure that parents and teachers, and we saw this during the pandemic, which was such a tough period, or is still we're still in the midst of coming trying to coming out, to come out of this all. Uh, we need to to make sure that that we protect uh, and and we help parents and and this is something that we've seen within companies i mean parents are not don't have i mean everybody anybody who was trying to to work and 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 raise and keep children in in school and help them learn knows this i mean so, uh, these connections about play and, and caregiving, which brings us back to, to community and, and ensuring that that we see, it's really like they say at the, when you get on a plane that you always have to put the mask on, the, on you first and then you put it on the child. It's kind of like that here too. If we don't take care of ourselves, we cannot take care of, of, of others. 
So, so I think it's really important that we rethink how we we see play and we see. Uh, Priscilla you said it really well too. How we connect with what we do and and we enjoy in this sense of connection that will allow us to 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 be a better human being and a and a better parent or caregiver. Thank you so much, Eva. That reminds me of the saying, you can't pour from an empty cup, right? Parents, exactly. caregivers need to fill themselves up before um, giving more to their children. And oftentimes that those perspectives or those priorities are shifted, but they're both equally important. Thank you all for sharing those, those insightful comments. We, I want to move on to a question from the audience, um, which pertains to equity in play. And one of our audience members wanted to ask you all, well, any experiences in integrating play with children with disabilities, deaf, blind, or deaf children? I can I can yes. give a personal experience. Uh, I actually have a brother with autism. He's 23 years old. And um, I think the experience comes from, depends on the disability that the child can have, but for example, autistic children tend to be more visual and with more color. So you can integrate play by, let's say like building a tower or if you like have a puzzle around. So I think like every single child, it doesn't matter the disability that they have, they're gonna play. Maybe they're gonna play a little bit differently. Maybe you have to adapt a play or a game so that the child is integrated. Uh, but there's definitely, um, I mean, and I just don't want to say like children with disability, but also play can be with anything that is around you. You don't have to play with bricks. You don't have to play with expensive toys. You don't have to play with anything, uh, but play can be with whatever is around you. And I don't know, Matilda, if this is a good time, but at one point you're going to be able to download a handout and it comes with very practical ideas of how can you integrate play in, in with a child child with disability. So it has a lot of, of, of different ideas. It also integrates some of Sesame's awesome play activities. Um, but play can be integrated with whatever you have around you. And if, especially if you have a child with disability, it's just as a parent, and I'm saying this as an older sister, I knew what my brother needs or what he likes. So I would just adapt a game that I know or that I know that it would catch. Um, his attention so that he's like actively engaged and it's just adapting like you don't need special tools you don't need anything uh, but what we what you have around you thank you Andrea and just a quick note to our audience those handouts that Andrea just referenced um, are in your handouts tab on the right uh, where you have your chat box there should be a section called handouts you just click on that Yeah, I think maybe uh, just adding a little bit to what Andrea was saying, I think that comes back to what we were saying that uh, play shouldn't be something preconceived, right? When you're talking, uh, when we're uh, playing with kids with disability, that's even more important to provide time and space for these children to, and observe them, you know, for the children to play the way they feel that they, they, they're they playing, that they feel happy. that uh, And I think it's important for them and it's important for us as well. I think we can learn a lot with uh, children in the spectrum of autism, like the way they connect with the world. Um, so I think it's both hands. So I think, again, this idea of not being worried about, uh, okay, so at one year old, the child needs to play this. needs to, And then with two years old, so letting it more, there is no one way of playing. So just understanding that I think helps a lot and takes a lot of way, I think also out of our shoulders as caregivers. And I agree. And I, I just wanted to, to add some, uh, and reference to the audience, some, some ideas and some content that, that we shared and, um, and Andrea and, and her team at, at the Lego Foundation, and we've collaborated. Well, I'm sitting here with only organizations that I love, admire, and, and work with. But but with the Lego Foundation, we're part of a, a group um, 
called Colectivo Primer Infancia in Mexico. And a few years ago, we did this really great a compendium of ideas for play. And there's some specifically that talk about bringing, integrating play with children with disabilities. And Andrea's nodding because she was directly very involved in developing this. So that was my this. baby. Yes. It's so in the handouts. So you, we can share that. And and then also um, with with Sesame Workshop, who we, we've partnered with, with a campaign that talks about, well, we, we have some content developed uh, with with other partners also that Sesame did on called um, Listos a Jugar uh, or or and and you can find a lot of content also about about play there and and we've recently launched a campaign called Usa tu Sesamo which really I love because I think it's one of the first times that Sesame also is di directing content at parents and not just at children, even though I think that Sesame Workshop from the very beginning talks to children and parents is one of the shows that I think if a parent is watching, we normally kind of enjoy. <laughs> and uh, but, but this campaign talks about integrating mental health and emotional health with physical health. And, and that's, I think, something that I was talking earlier, but I think it's really important because we, we, can, we tend to like to keep things neat and in silos, but really it happens at the same time. So the more we, we talk about how we, we integrate um, and look at health holistically. So there's, there's a character in this campaign called Cori, which after a heart, and it's really a really nice heart that, that talks about how we feel, but also about cardiovascular and, and, and how we exercise and how we listen to our heart. So I, I think it's really important that we look at health holistically and that we see mental health not as a separate category which I, I also think that is really important that we're talking so much about mental health and there I also think that that this conference is so important and provides such an important space and I'm so happy that that Glasswing has, is, is taking this topic uh, uh, to, to heart because it really it's it's really important that that we talk about this but that we talk about it in in the sense that it's integrated with 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 health in general for for us right and well-being of people but also of communities which i think is what what you you're talking about thank you eva thank you for that highlight and and i completely agree i think play is and, and at Glasswing we see this as well, right? Play is a channel to mental health improvement and to community resilience. It's a way for uh, communities to heal through social settings, and it provides a, a structured and unstructured space for communities to gather as well, right? There's so many different routes that play could uh, take, and it's not necessarily something that should sit on the sidelines or be disregarded as a means to improving mental health. Um, and with that as well, with adults and self-care, I mean, there's, and I really liked Andrea's point. I want to highlight that of play isn't defined as what we traditionally think play is as when we were kids. Play can be cooking. It could be riding a bike. It could be uh, coloring, right? I know coloring in adults has become so trendy in the past few years, um, right? And I think the fact that it became trendy just goes to show how important it is because it resonated with so many people. You started seeing all these adults coloring books all of a sudden start being published, right? And I think there's a need there. There was a need and it began to resonate with adults that play is a means of self-care. And our definition of play changes as we grow, but play itself shouldn't, right? Um, and with that, moving on to another question from our audience. Is play, and I know we talked about this at the beginning, but I do wanna highlight this question. Is play in adolescence just as important as play in children, right? We see a lot of research, and I know parents at the beginning are seeing um, when, like parenting 101, right? Like all this, all these things that you could do to boost a child's development, and it's all play. But what about in adolescence, a period that is defined by tumultuous times, hormones, moodiness? How important is play there? Yeah, I think if we, we feel... If we look at play also as an opportunity to to understand what we are feeling and to to understand what's going on in the world, that that's something that adolescents definitely need. We're like in the middle of all this. There's a lot going on here inside, and playing is a way to express and then test 
uh, and uh, I have a pre-adolescent at home as well. And uh, I see play as, and then of course it's a, like, so I told him the beginning of the, the year, he was uh, because of the pandemic, like he got used to talk to their, uh, to his uh, friends all the time on the computer, always, always in, in front of the screen. And of course, we, we know that it has a role and there is no way we can take out of his life anymore. But it's not just about that. So I asked him, do, because uh, he was telling me, oh, so, but mom, what else will I do? You know, like as if, so they, as if like, they don't know how to play anymore. So I asked him, so make a list of things that make you happy. And then one of the things in his list was volleyball play. Like, it's just like. And so he looked for volleyball, free volleyball classes, and he's doing like he's taking it very, very seriously, you know. So for him, volleyball play is 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 playing, and and that's something that he he's very, very. Um, it, it's something that helps him, and all these again, the movement back into movement. So I think it's uh, just finding what play is for each adolescent, which will change. It can be a play like drama. That's something that is also important. It can be arts. There are, that arts is so important for adolescents. Uh, and arts, I mean, like arts that you do with your hands, not just, I know they like a lot, like uh, doing things on the screen. And that's also arts. But I think arts that engage your body, engage uh, different abilities. I think that's definitely really, really important, especially in the moment that we are living, they're very attached to screen that is by itself disconnecting a little bit. Yeah, and if I just may add as well, like even just connecting it to mental health and one of the handouts is a link um, from UNICEF and it actually, it, it by age, you can see like tips on how to include play in mental health. And there is a couple of, of advice as to adolescents and maybe like in adolescence, of course, children are experiencing all of these changes to their body, to even their friendships. So even just like playing like you as an adult and as a parent, just trying to create some, as Priscilla said, like if your child really likes volleyball, then through volleyball as a caregiver, you can also kind of like support uh, the mental health of, of, of the adolescent and maybe even ask them like, how are you doing? How are your friends doing? Because it's it's a, such a horrible time that they're going through as an adolescent. So even just like your connection as a caregiver and as a, and as a parent to the child through play or through these activities that your child really appreciates, um, they're gonna also support um, their mental health. I, I think Andrea and Priscilla gave great answers and I'm not an expert on adolescence, but I, I agree with, I think it's the same principle. And I think play is about being joyful and in, in the moment and connected. And it's what we were saying. So I think it's as important or maybe even more important in adolescence than it is in any other uh, period in life. So um, I, I I go back to to what I think I learned here, which I, I I love this this definition of of that Andrea started with saying how we do every anything we do we enjoy that makes us feel connected, alive, and and joyful is play and 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 I think yeah I I also loved what Priscilla said about how we have so much going on inside in in, in adolescence that we're learning how to share and how to connect and and so it's even more important to find these outlets that allow us to 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 be connected and be in the moment and and, and so it can be through sports or through art or um just through even a very good conversation can feel playful right so it's, it's really about connecting um Thank you so much, Eva. We have just about a minute left before our panel ends. And I wanted to highlight a major takeaway that I heard today, which is that, and, and I mentioned this earlier, but there are definition of play changes as we grow older, but it's really important to remind ourselves that play itself doesn't, that we are still playing through um, through sports, through conversations, through meaningful activities, or even a car ride with our families can be playful, right? You have like little games here and there to, to entertain each other. But ultimately, play is never fully eliminated from our lives. 
and it shows up in different ways. And we as adults and as children have to remind ourselves to 